The first was a financial expert. The second was an active, not a non-playing member of the management team. The moment you become a non-playing or a playing member of the management team, you become faced with the ethical questions. And the third, of course, was to manage the accounting and finance team. The discussion today really hasn't changed. We're still going to have to walk that ethical tightrope the more we become part of and are part of the management team and making it happen. Just to make matters worse, we're going to raise the bar even higher. A recent survey by Grant Thornton and a UK company called Director Bank listed five key attributes of the outstanding CFO. Firstly, he had to have excellent communication skills. He had to have wider people skills and the ability to lead high caliber teams. <clears throat> he wanted commerciality. Wait for it, in-depth understanding of the business, in-depth understanding of the markets, in-depth understanding of the customers, in addition to finance and accounting. And of course, the ability to support and above all challenge the CEO. And finally, as an afterthought almost in the survey, an affinity with numbers, but more importantly, an ability to interpret them for others. <clears throat> the quote was, FDs need technical ability, resilience, honesty, integrity, qualifications, and years of toil before they can reach the top. Then they went on to say, to make it difficult for us all in this environment, but whilst technical competence is a given, too much deep technical expertise can be seen as detrimental. <clears throat> a recent FT article was called How to Create an Outstanding CFO, which I mentioned, but it started with the sentence, and I quote, Chief financial officers used to describe the past. Today, they're expected not only to envision the future, but to lead the way there. So if you were a CFO or an aspiring CFO, or indeed in practice, how would you balance that lot? I mean, appreciate, we've been trying to balance that since the role was invented. It has a very wide range of responsibilities, a mixture of conflicting ideas and conflicting interests of different stakeholders, and of course, numerous and even more today challenges from a complex global environment. So achieving that balance remains and will continue to be a huge ongoing challenge. The trick is to step back regularly and try and think about the bigger picture. And the other need is a foundation of personal ethics and integrity. And that is where we all come in. I do believe that as chartered accountants, we are instilled with that level of integrity and ethics. And that is really where we are going to be key in this new environment. Roger Matthews, who is chairman of a group in the UK, you may not know it here, a big property construction group called Mighty, said number one, and he was talking about CFOs, is you need to be a business partner with the CEO. There's got to be trust. You're very supportive to the CEO, but at the same time challenging and prepared to ask the question no one else is brave enough to ask. But it's also about image. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's looking. The logic of my slide that if no one's looking and the cat has no integrity, there will be no goldfish. Which Richard Pennycook, FD of Morrison's, which is a supermarket chain, said you need to have and I believe we as chartered accountants do have, the strength of character to say no. If you don't agree, whether it be with your CEO, and I'm talking from business, but from my days in practice with your client, or indeed with anybody else, that CEO-CFO relationship, or indeed client-CFO relationship, is a very delicate balance. Now, I'm not suggesting that CEOs are unethical, but what they do need welcome and use is a sounding board and you do provide significant thought about ethics and integrity and business and where it's going. Having said that, to make our life really exciting, the other important thing for CFOs and accountants is compliance. We have an enormous pressure to deliver the numbers, meet shareholder requirements, 
minimize taxes. What's the difference between avoidance and evasion? I appreciate the politicians believe that anything that reduces tax is evasion. We, of course, understand the distinction, but we have to address these issues. Very interesting banking example, which may resonate with you. Back at the start of the banking crisis in 2008, one of the banking CFOs, which didn't seek a government bailout, bailout was heard to remark that the previous three years he had been lambasted by the press and the analysts because his return on assets was only 17% and his competitors were doing 21%. He made the point that his competitors were now mainly state-owned. So we do need, there is a benefit. And in national and global markets, short-termism, what do you do as a CFO if your first cut of the results is rather less than the market was expecting? That's once you pass the fact that it's rather less than the CEO was expecting. You squeeze a bit more out or explain the shortfall? Well, I suppose if it's quarter one, you might just squeeze a bit more out on the basis it'll all get right later in the year. What happens as quarters two and three prove your point? When do you stop squeezing from a non-existent pot and start telling people that it's not going to be like that? And when do you stand up to your powerful chairman, your powerful chief executive, or the substantial shareholders and say, no? These are issues which I think we are going to have to think about much more. Even Ireland as a country, they had an average growth rate and they don't have the opportunities of China, so 6.5% for 1990 to 2007 was fantastic. Trouble was there were two growth phases. The first stage was based on export and productivity gains. And the second stage, as we now know, but people didn't tell them, was it was an unhealthy bubble on a housing boom that ran out of control. On top of that, we all have to comply with standards and regulations, and we have a wide spectrum in doing that of judgment. There's a range of outcomes depending on the judgments you make. But you, we, have to have the courage in this marketplace to stand up and highlight the risks. Judgment is a key mark of the professionals which we are. Proper exercise of that judgment, steering that fine line, and acting with integrity Doing the right thing when nobody's looking is what's expected of us all. And we are going to have to face, and I think this is the issue of the 2010-20s or whatever we're in, we are going to have to face this even more in the future than we did in the past.